10, 9, starts. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, all engine running. Liftoff, we have a liftoff, 32 minutes past the hour, liftoff on Apollo 11. So, ja, einen schönen guten Nachmittag, meine Damen und Herren, liebe Science-Fiction-Fans, liebe Weltraum-Abenteurer. Äh, heute Morgen war es ja schon super voll und super interessant und jetzt sieht alles noch voller aus, praktisch volles Haus. Da sind wir sehr glücklich drüber. Mein Name ist Bernd Diesinger, ich bin der Direktor des Filmmuseums. Ganz, ganz herzlich willkommen hier von mir und von meinem Kollegen, stellvertretenden Leiter Matthias Knob. Bei den Fluglinien heißt es ja immer, you know, you have a choice of airlines. Thank you for choosing us. Und äh, heute haben Sie natürlich auch eine Choice. Es ist ein wunderbarer Tag. Das äh, Rhein fließt glitzernd äh, durch die Stadt und die Eiscafés haben auf und Sie sind hier. Aber Sie haben die richtige Entscheidung getroffen, denn äh, nach einem spannenden Vormittag geht es jetzt ultra spannend weiter äh, bei unserer Erforschung der unendlichen Weiten, der Final Frontier. Und äh, wer uns dabei die ganzen Jahre geholfen hat, ohne dass wir das wussten, ich war seit einigen Jahren, weil ich, weil ich seit einigen Jahren mit ihm befreundet bin, aber vorher wusste ich es auch nicht, die meisten von uns wussten es bis heute vielleicht nicht, hinter den ganzen unglaublichen Tricks von Star Trek, von Raumschiff Enterprise, steckt der visuelle Effekte-Produzent Dan Curry aus Los Angeles, aus den Vereinigten Staaten. 18 Jahre hat er für Star Trek gearbeitet, Traumschiff Enterprise, für einige der Kinofilme etwas gemacht, aber besonders für die großen Serien Next Generation, Voyager, Deep Space Nine und Enterprise. Für seine unglaublich kreative Arbeit ist er ausgezeichnet worden mit sieben Emmys und ich sage gleich noch drei Worte zu ihm, aber erstmal ganz kurz begrüßen Sie gemeinsam mit mir Mr. Dan Curry. Und wenn ich von den äh, Spezialeffekten rede, ist das nicht das Einzige, was äh, Mr. Curry gemacht hat. Ich muss jetzt aufpassen, dass ich mich nicht verletze, ähm, denn... Dan Curry äh, hat, also wie gesagt, ein vielseitig talentierter Mensch. You won't, you, you won't survive this battle. <lacht> ja, anyways, so äh, die ganzen Waffen der Klingonen hat Dan Curry nämlich auch gestaltet und äh, ja, erfunden, designt, sehr ergonomisch. Ähm, er hat äh, ergonomisch und effektiv, denn er hat gesagt, ich hasse nichts mehr, I hate nothing more than a weapon that would not work. Und äh, die ersten Designer für Klingonenwaffen, die haben einen Mister hergezeichnet, hat gesagt, die verletzen die sich selbst mit, aber da kann man nie schön äh, Kämpfe mitführen. Hat also selber verschiedene Waffen entwickelt und auch den Kampfstil der Klingonen. Denn als junger Mann war er mit dem Peace Corps, jetzt wird's komisch, ne? mit dem Friedenscore, äh, war er in Thailand und hat äh, Brücken gebaut, Dämme. Und dafür hat er die Dorfbevölkerung jeweils überquatscht, äh, ähm, überredet, äh, ihnen ihren jeweiligen Martial-Arts-Kampfstil beizubringen. Eigentlich alles top secret, man redet nicht darüber, aber dann hat er gesagt, dann baue ich keine Dämme mehr. Nee, stimmt nicht. Also aus Begeisterung für seine Leidenschaft haben sie ihm das gezeigt. Er hat das alles äh, gelernt und dann, das ist wirklich kein Witz, es gibt Videos im Internet dazu. Er hat dann die äh, Klingonen tra trainiert. Ja, irgendwie so, hm, Sie können es alles sehen. Die ja. Und dann schauen Sie sich, den, dann, schauen, dann sehen Sie Dan, wie er das macht, und dann können Sie ein Parallelvideo sehen, wie Worf von den Klingonen das macht. Ja? Also er war der Lehrer den, der Klingonen und der Waffenbauer, aber er ist auch ein äh, äh, faszinierender Maler und Zeichner. Er hat auch die Zivilisation der Klingonen, die ganzen Städte und so weiter, was Sie da sehen, das hat er auch gemalt. Es ist einfach ein endloser Reichtum und jetzt äh, sind wir alle gespannt darauf, Dan, uh, what you are going to share with us from your incredible amount of knowledge and experience in the world uh, of Visual effects from the analog times to digital. Thank you once again for coming. Thank you. 
Thanks, Cynthia. Yep. Well, thank you very much for coming out on a beautiful uh, Saturday afternoon uh, to leave this uh, incredible weather in beautiful Dusseldorf to come into a black box theater. Um, <laughs> Uh, I've been very fortunate with my career. I have over three decades, uh, and my career started with doing everything photographically uh, by hand. Uh, and uh, we were uh, blessed on Star Trek to be able to help pioneer things moving into the digital world. So uh, my career went from medieval alchemy to uh, <laughs> algorithms. And uh, a lot of the stuff I will show you compared to Michael's brilliant work that you saw earlier today uh, is uh, Neolithic by comparison. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, my career started um, in, uh, actually in Thailand, I directed a weekly Thai language television series for children. And uh, <clears throat> then when I came back, I taught college for a couple of years, went back to grad school, uh, got a uh, Master of Fine Arts in Film and Theater, and uh, by a fluke, uh, I also uh, paint all the time, and uh, I had a one-man show, and Marsha Lucas had just finished uh, editing Taxi Driver and came to do a seminar on film editing, and uh, Marsha saw uh, some of my paintings and said... Uh, Mar Marsha Lucas is uh, George Lucas' wife. Uh, at that time. At that time. <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, so she asked me if I would be interested in uh, getting into matte painting, and uh, that led me into motion control photography and general visual effects. and. Um, so I started with the original Battlestar Galactica, Buck Rogers in the 24th century, and uh, worked on films that you might be familiar with, Top Gun, Raiders of the Lost Ark, uh, Indiana Jones. I did the title sequence and the map sequences for those, uh, just a little part of those great films. And uh, then uh, 118 films later, uh, I was uh, drafted by Paramount to uh, come and do uh, Star Trek The Next Generation, which everybody at the studio thought would be a failure. And uh, 18, year, 18 years later, I was still working on it. Yeah. <laughs> One of the unique things about working on Star Trek is we spent an average of 12 to 16 hours a day on set. and or shooting motion control miniatures. And it became family for us. And unlike every other production I worked on, there were no barriers between the different departments. Normally, each department is very protective of their part of the show, and there's very little interaction. Uh, while on Star Trek, <clears throat> it was not the same. So I was an honorary member of the art department, the stunt department, and, uh, and I would direct a uh, second unit, an occasional episode. And if you saw any like f uh, fight sequence, especially with bladed weapons or any technical uh, shot that was very visual effects complex, I would have directed those in second unit. And uh, I thought, uh, have to forgive me, uh, I don't speak German. I, I speak Thai and Lao, but uh, German is not one of my languages. <laughs> he doesn't speak German, but he understands. Okay, from the reaction here, I have the feeling that most of you understand what Dan says. Uh, if he starts his presentation, it will be very visual, very much uh, image driven. Uh, I could jump by to translate. Or is it sufficient if I only do that later during the Q&A we have after the second presentation? I feel that would be okay. What would you think? Is it okay? Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Then, then one last thing I want to mention before we start uh, at this wonderful exhibition we're having right now, Fantastic Worlds, Perfect Illusions. We have a great matte painting uh, done by Dan Curry, which shows a Starfleet Academy outpost. And we also have uh, the saucer top of the Enterprise D, which gets blown in the finale of Next Generation, tonight actually, starting at 9, 9 p.m. And then we'll give a brief introduction into this uh, very fascinating uh, series finale. So uh, please be also invited. Uh, we have a break after the second presentation and uh, 
my colleague Matthias Knob and I will give you a guided tour through the exhibition and then we have uh, cake and coffee and uh, then time for questions to Dan and the professor from Dortmund who will arrive a little later. So enjoy the presentation. Thank you once again, Dan, for coming. Thank, thank you all. Uh, uh, talking to Bernd, uh, we decided to how to order the uh, the presentation, and I thought I'd start with one of my favorite sequences. If I can read this, um, <laughs> where that? Oh, okay. So I'll start with one of my favorite sequences from the end, and then we'll go back into earlier work. And this is the launch from the pilot of Star Trek Enterprise with the great Scott Bakula as Captain Archer. Uh, Enterprise was the first uh, Star Trek series that's all CG. Next Generation was a primitive by comparison, and Paramount made a very creative decision at that time to not have a final product that was a film negative. And so we shot everything on film, but did a video compositing, which was a, an alien world for me. I came from the world of optical printers and uh, latent image. So uh, on Next Gen, we shot everything on film, uh, and there was one place in the world that could do uh, pin registered transfers uh, so that all the elements that we shot would actually fit together. In, in those days, uh, transferring from film to video, there were rubber wheels in the device, so the frames were not perfectly aligned. And there was a company called CIS that put the movement, the mechanical movement from an optical printer into the film transfer mechanism. And that way, the lights and the warp drive and everything would fit together. When you saw a simple shot with the Enterprise, we shot the same thing seven times. Once for what we called the beauty pass, which was the light on the hull, uh, the matte pass, which gave us the silhouette, and the uh, window lights, uh, the warp drive, and the deflector shield we shot with the uh, diffusion filter so it gave the illusion of glowing. And then if we had an explosion nearby, we'd shoot a separate pass with that light source. And uh, so, and then we ultimately, when we got to Deep Space Nine, and the episodes got very big. Uh, CG was primitive at the time, and we were dragged kicking and screaming to use it because the uh, the episodes had so many spaceships, we couldn't shoot them all in time. And so we would do hybrid shows where the background ships were CG, but the foreground ships were physical models. And uh, Voyager, we used more CG. And then when we finally got to uh, Enterprise, we just did everything in CG. And it changed my life from being very hands-on and doing stuff to being more like an orchestra conductor where I didn't play all the instruments, but I knew what I wanted the whole to be. But I would still do a lot of work myself. I still like to do my own matte paintings, and I would do a lot of the storyboards. And so I will show you next a an homage to our people who led the way. These are the pioneers on whose shoulders we all uh, rest upon. Jurassic Park there. <laughs> we still use that technique.
So without those great pioneers, I would be uh, uh, have to steal a shopping cart and move under a bridge. So I'm going to show you uh, an old, uh, an older reel from uh, primarily Star Trek work, and then some with uh, newer work. And here it is, and you can tell by the music its age. A couple of notes on that reel. If the image you're looking at now, the nebula in the background is a, uh, uh, I painted on uh, with an airbrush on black cardboard. And to get those light sources, I took uh, steel wool and rubbed it on a piece of clear acetate, put that in front of the lens so I could get those uh, light shards. And uh, uh, they were 40 watt light bulbs. And uh, the scene where, where uh, uh, Worf uh, throws a young man. I directed that episode, and the stud coordinator, coordinator wanted to do this really elaborate flip. And I said, well, Worf is so powerful that uh, this young guy would be like Worf swatting a fly. And I said, just do a one-hand throw. And the stud coordinator said, well, you can't do that. And I said, put your hand on my shoulder. And I threw him, and he said, OK, we'll do it that way. <laughs> uh, but that uh, throat cutting in that scene, uh, sometimes it's uh, better to do something real and cheap, uh, especially on a show like that. And so I, I put, p taped a plastic bag inside a, uh, a, a plastic waste can, filled it up with milk uh, that I'd cut a slit with a knife in it, and then just squeezed the milk out through the slot and tinted it red, and that was the blood coming out of his throat. This is a technology that went the way of buffalo hunting. Um, this is a latent uh, image, original negative uh, composite of a matte painting done for the original Battlestar Galactica. And so this shows the, the final shot. And uh, how you do this is uh, nothing can move, so you put your camera on a massive tripod and take every sandbag you can find and wake, weight it down so that a minor tremor won't even uh, move it at all. Then you build a black tent around the camera. Then you build a wooden frame in front of the camera, take a piece of black cardboard and block off what you don't want uh, in the final shot and save only the original. So in this case, here we go. So here's the actual set at Universal Pictures. And so you can see the lighting grid and the, on top, and that's, that's what we shot. And so when you uh, get a final uh, take, then you get, this is what you shoot when you block off the ceiling with a piece of black cardboard. Then I go home to the studio, and what you do is you uh, trace off where everything that you want to keep is and block out everything else. Then you project that, uh, you turn your camera into a projector by putting a prism inside the camera and a lamp house on the side. So now your camera's a projector. You project that through the lens you're going to photograph the painting with. And, and uh, then paint everything that's here, black, with a special paint called Sign Painter's One Coat, which is a very shiny, dense black, uh, black, uh, oh, very good, thank you. Um, it's a very dense black paint, and it's very shiny, but if you light it correctly, it becomes truly black. And then... You can have the next one here and the first one. Oh, better yet. Okay. Thank you. And you can show something here. It's magic. If you press like the first one, you can show someone. Oh, wow. That's Apple magic. I remain Neolithic technologically. <laughs> uh, so this, this is the painting. And so I, I did this on glass. And so here's where the black paint is. And then I planned over here to have a, a double exposure to make it look like the actors were at walking into light, which isn't really there. And so that's an oil painting. And then here's me in the days before, when I could still walk and had dark hair. Um, <laughs> and, but it gives you a sense of how big the painting was. Uh, here's my little painting stand. And I made this cool thing to hold wet brushes. Um, 
and uh, then here's the finished shot again. So uh, the problem with this technology is when you finally get a hero take on set, you give the you shoot a lot of test footage first, and then you give that to the uh, loader, and the loader goes in the truck, physically puts a notch on the edge of the film, so you can find the hero take later by touch. Then uh, you break when you go back. You only develop about uh, two feet of film. That's what you project up to get the thing. And every day you do a test to see how you're getting along. And it took about a week to get the mat line correct. And uh, after about three weeks, and when you're done with the painting and everything's lined up, you go back to the refrigerator and get the hero take, which is not yet developed, which is why it's called latent image, because the image is on that negative. And this was the very best quality available because the painting and the live action were on the same generation. And so, but you get one chance. If you put the notch on the wrong sprocket, you're done. So you have one chance, and I remember the first time I did this, it's really nervous, because I know that I would be really in bad trouble if I put the notch on the wrong, wrong sprocket. So thank God this technology is no longer required. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought it might be of interest to see how things were done in the, uh, in the stone age of filmmaking. All right. How do I get rid of Many of you are probably familiar with the Borg. And so the first time we saw the Borg was in Q Who. And one of the things that we wanted to do was show the interior of the Borg cube. Well, the only real set was that big. Everything else is. And, and the great uh, painter Sid Dutton did this for me. And it's. Um, he was Albert Whitlock's uh, protege. If you know Al, Albert, Al was probably the greatest of all traditional matte painters. And uh, so Bill Taylor, Al's assistant, cut out a hole in the painting, which is on masonite, put a little rear projection material in, and rear projected this and shot it with a motion control camera. And So our stalwart crew has beamed onto the Borg cube, and now they see how big it is inside. So this is an oil painting on masonite. And then years later, I had the opportunity to do it, uh, redo it in a digital format, and this is what the revision is in high def. And so we changed a lot of the stuff around to give more detail that wasn't there So these show the elements. And the actors have to be really good pretending they're lo looking inside a vast space when they're on a crummy looking soundstage. And here's the actual, that's the rear projection. So that's the only part of this shot that's real. And then by shooting it on a motion control track, uh, you create the illusion that you've pulled back on it. And that way, the rear projection and the painting uh, hook up together correctly. So this is from the episode, The Dauphine where this uh, young lady comes aboard and showing all the elements. And by the way, that planet in the background, uh, it's a well-known story. I don't feel bad about sharing it. Uh, one of my, uh, one the first time we've used this planet was in a different episode, which required a, a something described as a brown mottled mining planet. And we had 
satellite photographs from NASA. We had macro shots of rocks in my garden. We had little paintings. And, and we had a very primitive device called the Sony System G, which could take a flat image and wrap it around a virtual sphere. And I looked at all the images, and I wasn't really happy with anything. And my assistant gets up, and he goes in the back room, and he threads up a piece of negative on the, the machine. And I see it wrapped as a planet. And I say, yeah, that's pretty good. That looks brown and mottled. And what is that? And he said, I can't tell you. He said, no, seriously, what is that? I won't say. So you know if you took toothpaste and you pressed it down and pulled your hand up like that, you get little spikes. I noticed those formations. And finally, I began to discern kernels of undigested corn. And the Nike logo from his sneaker was there. And he finally admitted that he was getting out of his car and planted his foot in something that had been a dog's meal the day before. <laughs> and. Uh, in an attempt to turn a bad situation into good, he happened to have a still camera with him with a macro lens, took a close-up of it, and I said, well, I don't care what it was. It looks cool. Put a little weather over it. And so we nicknamed it Ficus Canis, and it was a planet in seven episodes. <laughs> Okay, now this shot, uh, this is in before uh, morph uh, software was available. These are hand-painted morphs, uh, one frame at a time. Give me one more look. And on the left is the original, and on the right is the uh, high-def remake, but it was done the same way. Okay, this is also from QHU, and same thing, it shows the original on the left and the high def on the right. And the Borg cube has the ability to heal itself. And how I did that was I had a model maker uh, make this model, which is about four feet by four feet, and then laid it flat on the floor so it the gravity wasn't affecting how the plastic would bend, held a welding torch on either side of the lens to melt the plastic, and just, I got five takes out of it, and uh, just picked the one I like best, and that's what you see in the screen. Now, this is here in the museum, and uh, uh, it's a, an oil painting on masonite, and one of the, the reason I'm showing this, you may want to see the original, but when you do, take a look at uh, close up and you'll see little holes in it and those holes were so that I could put I drilled holes in the painting and put little grain of wheat light bulbs behind it and on a separate pass shot those so that I could make blinking lights like uh, you might find at an airport so and that's um, that's that painting and originally I did this painting for Buck Rogers in the 24th century or 25th century, whatever it was. And, <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, I happened to have that painting around, and we wanted Starfleet Outpost, and we're out of money, so I dredged that out of my garage and painted the Starfleet logo on the, uh, <laughs> on the building, and now it became Starfleet. <laughs> and, okay, we did uh, an episode uh, called All Good Things, which we'll be showing tonight, I think. And uh, uh, there's a sequence in it that I thought might be interesting to talk about for those who will stay around to see the movie. And we had to go back to primordial Earth. And Q was testing Captain Picard, who might have eliminated the possibility of all life on Earth by if he messed with this water in a pool that had a collection of chemicals that uh, would lead to the creation of life on Earth. And in order to create this, oh, here we go. Uh, so this is the real set, and everything else is so the top parts of painting, I went down to Laguna Beach and shot the ocean uh, with an old Mitchell 35 millimeter movie camera. Uh, then the sky is made out of liquid nitrogen bubbling up through a hole in black cardboard and cross lit so it has this kind of uh, kinetic behavior. And then the foreground is a model made with uh, uh, 
with a spray foam that's been s stirred up with cardboard so it had a lumpy surface. And then the lava is actually methicil. And if you're not familiar with methicil, it's this viscous material that uh, has the same consistency as mucus that McDonald's uses to thicken milkshakes. Uh, <laughs> enjoy the next time you have one. <laughs> and uh, and we built it on a uh, plexiglass table so I could put lights underneath and floating on top of the methicil were uh, crumbled burnt cork and uh, uh, vermiculite, which gardeners use. And so, and it's at a slight slope, so it runs down and we were able to dribble more stuff into it. So that's how that one was made. And then here's a scene where, uh, from the same episode where Captain Picard is looking in the distance and we used a different angle on the uh, the glowing table, the volcano is a painting, but the the lava coming up is uh, baking soda that I just threw up in the air and shot at very high speed, so it looked like ejecta. And the, uh, the smoke is liquid nitrogen uh, shot against black velvet. Okay, here's one of my... There are two things on Star Trek I'm especially proud of, and one is the title sequence for Deep Space Nine, and the other is the title sequence for Voyager. And when we were building it, uh, the, Tony Meininger, the incredibly great model builder, uh, built the Deep Space Nine hero model. And we built two models, one that was a full uh, 360 model and another one that was a half model so when you look out the window of Deep Space Nine it looks like you're looking across the layers of the structure and so I went and Tony had made a rough plywood mock-up of it so uh, for me to look at and so we could figure out how we we're going to use it on the motion control stage so we had to be able to flip it over and so I went down and I immediately upon looking at it thought of a ballet around the station the original title sequence, uh, the underlying theme was, we are alone out there. And after several seasons, Star Trek became a hub of activity, and they wanted to re, uh, redesign it. And I, here's the, uh, uh, the, the storyboards that I did for the new title sequence. And so this would be an example of my storyboarding work. So I spent about oh, maybe five minutes a panel draw, doing these drawings. You never have time. So you can see we added more ships so that it was busier. And my friend John Knoll came through with more spacemen for me. <laughs> and so that's that was the revised title sequence. And I'll show you Voyager now. And same thing, without the great score, this wouldn't have been as good. So uh, filmmaking is a team sport, and it requires a lot of people with a lot of skills. And there's no single hero to any film, or certainly no single hero to visual effects. And if there were, it wouldn't be me. Um, but uh, so it's, these are a combination of, this is a hybrid sequence. Uh, there are physical paintings, like one of the planets is it, something I painted on cardboard. One of the planets is CG. Uh, the Voyager model most of the time is uh, a physical model, but sometimes it's CG. And uh, my colleagues from Santa Barbara Studios uh, worked with me on this to create the sequence. Okay, this shot almost didn't make it into the title sequence. The producers were busy. They had a movie going and two series, so they were re really busy. And they said, uh, just do your dream of space travel. So I thought of all the things I'd like to go, uh, places I'd like to go if I could go in space. And this shot, uh, there were a couple of producers and me in the room looking at the sequence. And the, one, the executive producer said, that shot is beyond loathing. I hate that shot. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I think it's kind of a cool shot. And he said, I can't stand that shot. you got to do a new one. I said, well, we're on in a couple of weeks. I don't have time to do a new one. And I, let's round up some, some uh, cold eyes. So I rounded up people in the office, and they came in, and they... And after they looked at the sequence, so many of them said, oh, that shot's really cool. And reluctantly, uh, the executive producer let it stay in the sequence. 
Okay, this is relevant because uh, one of the objects from this sequence is in your museum here, and it is the Boar Queen's arm. And so the, I put this little sequence together to show you um, the Boar Queen demo. And so this is the, the set as it is the only moving thing on the set were the lights and that elevator, which was kind of shaky. Um, and then here's the finish shot with the Borg Queen's head and shoulders coming down, finishing the cut. <laughs> and so getting rid of the pieces we didn't want. Replacing it with the CG stump and spine. And in this case, uh, I had the idea that I wanted to do the uh, 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 construct it in a different way. And one of the features, John Knoll uh, had the Borg Queen coming out like uh, a shirt in a laundry, uh, and her head and spine were planted into her, her body. I wanted to do it a different way. And I said, well, wouldn't it be cool if the floor could move, which it couldn't? So um, working with the great digital artist, John Tesca, uh, we were able to do the sequence. So here's the actual set. and I wanted body parts to come up out of the floor, and here they are. So here's the original shot. And by the way, it took uh, the two uh, actors who played the Borg Queen six hours to get into that outfit and uh, four hours out. Um, in the final episode, uh, the Borg Queen is implanted with a virus and decides to disassemble herself. So what I asked Alice to do was to put pink uh, over parts of her body that would be disappearing and had to shoot it at a lockdown. So I would shoot a clean plate of this empty set so I could replace something where the where the red arm is. And uh, and then uh, the red allowed the artist to do to rotoscope or trace trace it because it's a dark set. The, the artist had to be able to see that. And this is where she tosses her arm away and the thing she throws is upstairs. And here she throws it. And so that's a CG thing. And then we used a real hand on the other end. And another CG stump. And I was very concerned that when Alice stood up, her arm would naturally fall in front of her body. And that was unacceptable because I didn't want it there. So then here I am helping her stand up, but secretly keeping her arm out of the way. It's not easy being Borg. <laughs> now on Star Trek Enterprise, because we were an all CG show, we had the opportunity to do more uh, CG uh, creatures and, and elements. And uh, in the last couple of seasons, we had the Zindi, which were, uh, they had insectoids, uh, aquatics, and, and I wanted to do things that didn't 
wouldn't be a person in a suit. And so here's a demo of the how we did some of those. So I designed the creature inspired by a Mosasaurus, but I needed arms and opposable thumbs so it could have a technical culture. And here's the rigging, shows the number of artists required to create something like this. And here's the final shot. Then occasionally we had uh, a lot of what we called light bulb creatures or energy creatures. And in this case, uh, an energy creature comes in into the ship and takes over one of our crewmen. So, I walked through the set carrying a broom so the actors would know where it would fly and they'd know where to, what to look at. <laughs> and then here's... And then I wanted it to take the actor's face and kind of enter him and then So here are some of the pieces required. Here's the mat or the alpha channel. And one of the characters was the uh, Zindi insectoids, and they were sentient insectoids. Originally, I wanted to have them have six appendages like a, a terrestrial insect, and we realized the animation time would be so much more, so we decided that when they evolved into sentience, they, they lost one of their appendages. So I designed the head loosely based on a, an, an ant. Here's a Zindi warrior. Then here's John Tesca's CG version of it. And then in this case, the set is just a little painting I did. And I had the idea, uh, we couldn't afford motion capture. So I had this idea that if we put a grid suit on a stand-in, that way the director could direct an, an actor who would deliver a performance, but by having a grid, the, the animator, in this case John Tesca, would be able to see the creature's arms in perspective and know how to match, match the performance. Here's the final shot. But uh, a few years ago, I worked on a, a film that no one will ever see, uh, a remake of Clan of the Cave Bear uh, that we shot in Africa. And it's about a human girl who's adopted by Neanderthals and uh, grows up to become a Republican. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so you can look at uh, Clan of the C Cave Bear, a, a uh, a hunting sequence of Neanderthals uh, hunting uh, extinct giant bison. Uh, this was uh, executive producer Ron Howard, uh, the great director Pierre Morel, who did the first Taken, um, and we were in the wilds of South Africa. And we had one, uh, the interior of the cave on set in Cape Town, but a partial exterior on set in uh, on location in the mountains of South Africa, and we wanted to do a shot where we uh, pull down from the moon and push in where the uh, cavemen are having a prom. So these are some of the elements. And I uh, had my assistant make these little uh, party lights inside of a uh, ping pong balls, then here's how I calculated the geometry uh, so that the camera move would match both in both places because I shot the first part of the move on location and the second part on set in South Africa, as you see here in Cape Town. And here's the location and we were freezing.
And so here's the final shot. And of course you hear great uh, Neolithic percussion sex. And I'm going to, oh, and this is what I want to show you, bison hunt. So here's our location, and it had a 120-foot uh, blue screen and a giant ca crane out on location so I could move it around, and because we were constantly chasing the light. And those little white dots are tracking marks so that you can uh, repeat the camera move. And that little gray thing is something that the uh, hunters could stab and then, so the actors would have a sense of how big the animal was. We made a, a cut, cut out and I just drew a face on it to make it more interesting. And then here's the final sequence again. And having a lot of smoke really hides a plethora of sins. <laughs> yeah, there we go. So, hey, thank you so much for your patience. This is not a testament to me. This is a testament to all the wonderful artists and, and technical people I worked with. So it's really for them. So, okay. Uh, wir werden dann uh, gleich wiedersehen. Ja, wir haben jetzt die Guide Tours durch die uh, Ausstellung. Uh, deshalb gehen wir jetzt auch hoch. Dan wird uns gleich auch folgen. Dann gibt es danach den Vortrag von Professor Tolan, der sich vor allen Dingen mit Star Trek beschäftigt hat und was bei vor allen Dingen Star Trek vor Voyage Home, zurück in die Gegenwart, was vielleicht wirklich möglich wäre und was unter Umständen nie möglich wäre. Das werden wir gleich hören und dann werden wir die beiden noch einmal befragen können zu Star Trek and Beyond. Erstmal vielen Dank für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit und dann äh, bitte ich Sie, auch in die Ausstellung zu gehen, eine kleine Pause zu machen. Es gibt Kaffee und Kuchen und äh, dann finden wir uns gleich wieder hier ein. Vielen Dank für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit. Uh, one last thing. Uh, coming up this summer, look for a book uh, that's coming out uh, about uh, the evolution of uh, visual effects on Star Trek uh, and some of my work. So keep an eye for it. Yeah. And it's written by Dan Curry. <laughs> okay, see you in a little while. <laughs>